Good morning. If you would, please open up to 1 Corinthians 15, if you have your Bibles with you. And we'll spend time there this morning. 1 Corinthians 15. So about three weeks ago or so, I was listening to uh, the sermon sitting in the back there, and I was thinking, uh, Ken, you punk, you took my sermon idea. Yes, I called Ken a punk. But then I realized it wasn't my sermon idea, and it wasn't even his sermon idea. Why? Because God has given us the best sermon, the old reliable truth, and a good preacher won't depart from it. So if you have your own sermon idea, you're wrong to start with. See, the idea of the gospel, the good news is is God's, not ours. Now, sure, a great many men can preach the gospel better than I can, but no one, I guarantee you, can preach a better gospel. So I'm going to have our attention on this this morning, and that is just simply the gospel, what it is and what it isn't, and what place it should hold in our lives. I want to think that such an important message as the gospel would never lose its place, right? We would think that would never happen, such a simple declaration that has changed so many lives, has changed the world, would never be surrounded by so much confusion. But I fear that this is exactly what has happened, especially in our day. In a day and age when our culture has so much confusion even about what a gender is, is there any surprise that they would not know what the gospel is? Now, sadly, the modern church, I hate to say it, isn't helping. It's making things worse by what they proclaim from pulpits. Not all churches, but some of them. But again, this problem isn't really new to us and our generation. And why? Because men from the very beginning have always been sinners. They've always been forgetful. They've always wanted to twist what God has told us into something that they want to believe. And that's why the gospel has to be preached anew again and again to every generation in every generation I don't know if you realize this, but you know that this year, 2017, is the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. Do you know that? That 500 years ago, Martin Luther nailed that 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg. And was, what was that document, by the way? Well, basically what it stated, you know, in certain terms, was this, that what was being told to the people was not the gospel, and he wanted to correct it. So the Reformation was born to reform the church, to bring it back to its most basic message this ought to demonstrate us the importance of doing that every time we get up here. Now, from very even early on, we see that this is a sad state of affairs. If you look at the first part of the text this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes to them this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now he says he would remind them. I'm reading from the ESV. In other translations, it probably says, make known to them, or some variation of that. And the Greek word there is gorinzo. Did I say that right, Greg? Where's Greg again? Gorinzo. To make known. It doesn't mean to remind. He wasn't telling them something that he just needed to casually remind them, like, hey, I need you to remind you to go to the store and pick this up. Now, this word means to make known emphatically. But didn't they know the gospel already? I mean, there's a church there, right? He's writing to the church. Why? Why would he need to say, I want to make known to you the gospel? Had they forgotten? Well, they think they knew it in their head. But let's not forget who Paul is writing to here. The church at Corinth. A very spiritually troubled church. Think about the problems that he's already addressed in this very letter. Divisions of Christian preachers, sexual immorality, incest, arrogance, trivial grievances resulting in lawsuits, marriage, divorce, widows, food offered to idols, head coverings, worship, social snobbery at the Lord's table, fights on which spiritual gift is the best. Now, all these things were problems, right? That's why he's addressing them. And why? Because they had forgotten, and by that I mean made less important, the very gospel that he had preached to them. So here he says, I want to make known to you, again, what I've preached to you already. The gospel that they had received, in which they stand, by which he says they are being saved if they hold fast to it. So he tells them that he would, Narizzo, Make known to them again what he's told them. 
So again, it's a term of emphasis to tell them again and again of their first love. It was no casual reminder, but a calling back statement with purpose. And notice again the definite article there. The gospel. Ta evangelion. The gospel. Not a gospel, not one of many gospels, but the gospel. The only one concerning Jesus Christ. Now in the world's eyes, we know that they think there are many gospels. Even they don't call them the gospels, they think that there's many gospels. You just choose the one that suits you, the one that you want to believe, the one that makes you feel better, and that's the gospel to you. But Paul doesn't think like that here. For him, there's only been one gospel that's ever been preached, ever. It goes back to what I said a few minutes ago. It's not my gospel, it's not Kim's gospel, it's not Southside's gospel, it's God's gospel from the very beginning. From the very first promise back in Genesis 3, right after Adam's fall, which we call the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel announcement which God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and your offspring and the woman and her offspring. You shall bruise, uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So I think it's fascinating to think that that announcement that God gave them right there is the same gospel that Paul's preaching to the Corinthians. It's not changed since the beginning of time. And we're very fortunate in this place to hear that every week. In fact, to preach something other than this gospel, what I'm going to tell you this morning, also comes with sharp words from Paul in Galatians. He says, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That's strong words. Let him be accursed if they preach a different gospel. Now, why would Paul use that? Right? It's just news. It's just an announcement. Why does that carry such weight? Well, the answer is what we already read in 1 Corinthians. Because it, the gospel, is by which people are saved. That's eternity. It's dealing with people's souls. That's why Paul says, let them be accursed if they preach a different one. That's why he reminds the Corinthians here of the same one that he's already preached. I want to get to what Paul tells us the gospel is, but first I want to turn our attention to what the gospel is not. Now, as I stated, there's a lot of distortion, a lot of misconception, and frankly, just a plain old heresy about what people think the gospel is. So for starters, the gospel is not be better. That's not the gospel. That is not good news to tell someone, be better or try harder. That is not the gospel. Just try harder. I think that's fairly basic, but I never want to assume that because a lot of people believe that. Because be better or try harder leads to a works righteousness, a righteousness based on what you can do to attain it, and not an alien righteousness or righteousness that comes from without that is placed upon you through Jesus. Now, there's many ways that that manifests itself. Some are more obvious than others. Some say the gospel is just being a good person. Not necessarily be better or try harder, just, just be a general nice guy. That's the gospel. To have some sort of moral standard that the rest of the world or your neighbors don't have. The problem is, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of moral, very moral, unbelievers. Okay? That's not the gospel. So how is it the gospel when you're just better than someone else? That's not good news. Maybe good news to you, but that's not good news inherently. Or perhaps maybe the idea is that somehow there's this scale, right? That on one side you have what you've done wrong, and on this side you have what you've done right, and at the end of your life what you hope is the case that this side kind of outweighs this side, and if that's the case, then that's the gospel. You've done it right. right? You've, you've achieved what you needed to achieve. That's not the gospel. The gospel isn't just loving your family or taking care of them, husbands and fathers, or submitting to your husband, wives, or loving your wife, or obeying your parents. Those things should be done because of the gospel, but when someone tells you to just be a better person or to love your family, that's not the gospel. That's not the good news. The gospel is not having the right system, the right doctrine opposed to everyone else, 
And a lot of people can think and know right doctrine, and they're lost because they don't possess the gospel. It's just winning an argument. I just know so many things that you don't know, and that's the gospel. But it's not. The gospel is not a command to be believed. Now, is there an imperative to believe the gospel? Absolutely there is. You should believe the gospel. That's what the Bible tells us. But to tell someone to believe the gospel is not the gospel in and of itself. The gospel is not something that asks or demands or commands. The gospel is not repent and believe. People say, what's the gospel? Well, it's repenting and believing. That's not the gospel. That's what you're supposed to do. It's not the news. The gospel is not even what goes on in your heart in regeneration. As wonderful as that is, the Holy Spirit working in your heart is not the gospel. That's because of the gospel. So if all these things are not the gospel, then what is it? That's one of the most important questions we can ask. Because if you don't know what it is, how can you believe it? And if you can't believe it, how can you be saved? Because God says there's no other way. Because Paul said, by it, the gospel, people are being saved. So I want to look at what Paul says the gospel is, but before he defines it, he writes something else. Look at verse 3. He says, I, For I delivered to you as of first importance... What I also received. Now he says here that what was first delivered was of first importance. Now Paul also delivered to them things of importance, didn't he? But here, what he's about to remind them of was of first importance. In order to take that here, not only as the first thing that he told them, which I think it was, but the first thing, the primary thing, the most prominent thing, the top priority of first importance. So we have to ask ourselves, is that our top priority as it was for Paul? Is it the primary thing? Not that these other issues aren't important, right? The Lord's Supper is obviously important. Marriage is obviously important. But what's the most important thing? Well, it better be the gospel. Our priorities here show. For instance, I'm only going to use this as a demonstration. But last week as we were leaving the, the church building, I passed by two young gentlemen who have a lot of muscles. Um, but I passed them, I jokingly said, you know what, you guys should really teach me how to be all muscular and stuff. Now, I know how that's done, right? I know how that, that happens. They make a priority, right, of going to the gym, and when they do that, it, it shows, right? And by the way, I went to the gym three times last week, nothing. <laughs> so I don't know what the disconnect is. Yeah, you'll have to help me, but... But is the gospel a priority? Does it show? Do people know that you're a Christian, that you believe the gospel? Is it a priority for you? Is it for you like something it was for Paul that he returned to over and over in every single letter that he wrote constantly? Something he desired to make known again and again emphatically? Now, if you know 1 Corinthians, if you spent any time in that book, think about everything that Paul has talked about in the first 14 chapters. All very important things. Love, orderly worship, spiritual gifts, uh, behavior at the Lord's Supper, principles of marriage. But here he says what tops them all, the most important thing, is the gospel. And I'm going to tell you that again. So Paul, still in verse 3, says he delivered to them what he also received. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that Paul didn't make the gospel up. He did not invent it. It was given to him by God. This is not Paul's message. This is Paul giving them God's message. No man invented it. Consider again what he says in Galatians. He says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thus, the message that he received is the one that he's preaching the one that he delivered to the Corinthians in this very letter is of first importance. And if you're a minister of the word, that's the most important thing that you have to do is you take what's been given to you in whole and you pass it on. That's your job. That's a faithful minister or a preacher of the gospel, to take what's been given to you and to pass it on without detracting from it, without adding to it, without changing it. 
but the message that you received, you delivered to someone else. I know I've kept you in suspense, but what Paul says the gospel is, I'm going to tell you what that is right now. So I'm going to let him define it. Continue in verse 3. I'm going to stop at two words, so be ready. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ. Stop. That Christ. Who? Christ. Jesus Christ, one whom this entire book is about. And I know I say that every time I get up here, that this book is about him, but it's important. You take him out of here. You take him out of Paul's letters, and you don't have God's word anymore. You don't really have a coherent story or moral guidelines. You have nothing that any human should be interested in. But again, what did Paul deliver to them? That Christ, that, that phrase is similar to that glorious uh, phrase that Ken mentioned last week even, but God. You remember that? But God in Ephesians 2. That's one that Dr. Lloyd-Jones preached on for um, like forever. <laughs> he also mentioned this word, therefore, right? There's these phrases in Scripture that we catch. But God, therefore, I'm going to give you another one, that Christ. So in adding to our list of what the gospel is not to help us define what it is, I also want to tell you that the gospel is not about you. And that hurts our pride because we think it is about us, but it's not about you. You are beneficiaries of it. You know it. You've been told it, but it's not about you. And as much as we don't like to hear it, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. It's not about what we do, what we've done, what we plan on doing with it, how we feel about it, how we think about it, but rather it's about Jesus Christ and what he's done. That Christ, that Christ what? Well, here it is. Now we get to Paul telling us what the gospel is. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the gospel. I want to pause there for a moment. That seems incredibly simple, right? If we've grown up in church for any amount of time, that should be almost second nature to us, and, and I hope that we're not bored with it. We shouldn't be bored with it, but that's the gospel. It's as simple as it is. The three basic elements that make up that gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and he's no longer dead. That is the gospel. And if that's not preached if that's not what you're hearing, if that's not what you're telling people, then you're not hearing and you're not preaching the gospel. You're preaching something else. So all these things that we add to it, to that simple basic message, to make it more attractive to people or to change it to make it more palatable to people so they can receive it um, or take away from it to determine what it is or what makes a Christian better than an, a non-Christian or I'm a better Christian than you are because I believe these certain things, all that is is a perversion of what Paul says the gospel is. This means that the gospel is more important than all of our hobby horses. All the things that are not in the gospel we try and put in place of the gospel is of first importance. That's a perversion. It isn't if you have the right political affiliation. It's not whether you homeschool or whether you don't homeschool. It's not whether you vaccinate your children or if you don't vaccinate your children. It's not whether you drink or whether you don't drink. It's not even the news, by the way, that we're sinners. That's true, right? We're sinners, but that's not the gospel. That would be part of the gospel presentation, but it's not the gospel itself. So the gospel is the declaration or the good news or the glad tidings of Christ and what he has done. It belongs to him because it's concerned with him and his person and his work. That Christ what? First, that he died for our sins. Whose sins? His no, ours. But who died? Well, Christ died. That's the reason that he died. He died because the world was plunged into death through sin, and every soul that sins against the holy God must die. And Christ died, and yet he didn't sin. So he had to die for someone else's sin. That's what we call the substitutionary atonement. Paul then adds, in accordance with the Scriptures. So Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Meaning that Paul is delivering a message that is not new, as I reminded you earlier, but something that was prophesied, told to us, related to us by the prophets, by the history of the Bible, 
even before Christ took on flesh and was born of a virgin. Well, what scriptures? Well, they didn't have the New Testament yet when Paul was writing this. Right? They had the Old Testament. That was their Bible. So those are the scriptures they possessed. These are the scriptures that Paul says they're in accordance to. Scriptures like Isaiah 53, where he says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned everyone to his own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That's the Old Testament telling you that Christ died for our sins. Or something like Zechariah 13. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now I read all of that Isaiah because who can say it better than God? I can't come up with anything better than that. But you see, in accordance with passages like this, Paul says, Christ died for our sins. It's not something he made up. This is what the Bible told us was going to happen. That the second Adam, David's heir, Abraham's true offspring, the Most High Priest, would die, as Paul declares, for our sins. Thus, we do not have the gospel if we do not de declare that Christ died for sins that he did not commit. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried, is the second part, right? And was buried. We don't bury people who are alive, right? Or at least we shouldn't. If you're doing that, stop. <laughs> we bury people who are dead, right? So unless Christ had died, he wasn't buried. Simple. Again, going back to Isaiah 53, even this is told to us in the scriptures. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had none, no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So even the fact that Christ was buried is told to us by the Old Testament. He died and was buried, laid in that ground or in that hill, because he was dead, in accordance with the Scriptures. But hear this, okay? Make no mistake about this. Saying simply that Jesus died for our sins is not the gospel in and of itself either. Okay? Hear that again. Simply saying that Jesus died for our sins is not the gospel in and of itself. That almost sounds like heresy, doesn't it? Okay. Wait till the next part. Why? Because lots of people have died. Right? There's, there's Buddha died. Muhammad died. I'm going to die. We, we know died. I don't even know the English that is. I'm going to die. Right? We know people who have died. That is not the gospel in and of itself that Jesus died. We know that he died. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and this is what makes the gospel complete. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So the gospel is not that Jesus died, it's that Jesus died and is no longer dead. That's the gospel. You can't leave that out. Because if he wasn't raised from the dead, he's still dead. And that's not good news. That's a nice thing that he did, but it's not good news. So the gospel isn't just that Jesus Christ died for our sins, but whether Christ died for our sins, they buried him, and he was raised on the third day. Again, what good news would it be to say that Jesus died if he had not been resurrected? Right? If he had died and not been resurrected, we would not be here this morning. We celebrate the Lord's Day every Sunday because we believe that he was raised from the dead. That's why we do it, until he returns. I want to keep it in context here in Corinthians, and I'm not going to go into all of this because we don't have time. But what Paul is doing here by talking about Christ this way is setting up the next portion of his letter in uh, the next few verses about the resurrection of the dead because the Corinthians were having a very hard time with that. They didn't believe it. So he starts with saying, I know someone who was raised from the dead, therefore there is a resurrection. That's basically what he's going to do. 
The third element, again, is his raising from the dead, and it's vital. Again, it too, as he says, is in accordance with the scriptures. So the fact that he was going to die for our sins, that he was buried, and now also that he was raised from the, on the third day is accordance to what the Bible has already told us. For instance, Hosea 6.2 speaks on a resurrection. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Psalm 16, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. God promised that, though, that through Abraham's offspring, the nations would be blessed. How would that be possible if the offspring was dead? He promised that David's son would sit on the throne forever. How is he going to do that if he's dead? So again, this good news isn't simply that Jesus died, for our sins, but he was raised from the dead as well. Thus again, the gospel is not about you. You notice I've said anything about you except for the fact you contributed sin, but about Jesus Christ. He died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. It's that simple. See, this is the good news. This is God's gospel, and news is made to be reported, right? We report the news. What does Paul do to continue to establish this case of what the gospel is? Continue in verse 5. After Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day, Paul tells us this. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and lastly, as a one untimely born, also to me. So not only can we rely on what God has told us about his death and his burial and his resurrection, because it all happened in accordance with what the Bible said was going to happen, but people saw him as eyewitnesses. They saw him die. They watched him die. Women looked on as they buried him. As Paul stated above, once he was raised from the dead, he didn't go into hiding. People saw him. He appeared to Cephas, who was Peter. He appeared to a multitude of people after that. People saw him alive. That's how the gospel is established. And they told people, and they told other people, and those people told more people, and here we are today. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I am so tired of this word, fake news. Okay? Fake news. Think about that for just a second. Have we fallen so far, or are we so bored with what's really happening in the world, that we use any news time that we have to talk about fake news. Here's the news. Here's some fake news. You realize we come to a point in our society where we can't even tell what true news is anymore? Some of it might be true. Some of it might be false. It all might be false. It all might be true. We don't know. We just spend our time talking about if it's really news or if it's fake news. We don't even talk about what the news is. We just talk about whether it's fake or not. Now, I read somewhere that something like 65% of people get their news from social media now, okay? 65%. That's a lot. That's a place, social media is a place designed to allow freedom to, to post, to uh, write, to comment, to blog, tweet, like, blurb, you know, whatever, belch, whatever you want to do online. <laughs> With little or no consequence. You can do anything you want on social media and nobody cares. Because nobody held you accountable. By the way, I read that on Facebook, so I know it's true. <laughs> See, we're being conditioned by one group of people to tell us to believe everything that we hear, and we're being conditioned by another group of people saying, don't believe anything that you hear. And that's the problem that we have. But I praise God this morning that the news that Paul gives is not fake news, it's established, it's real. News that has been substantiated, not only by our witnesses, but by, God, but by what God has told us in his word, who is the best witness of all. He appeared to Cephas, he appeared to the apostles, he appeared to 500, and yet above that all, we have the testimony of God's own word that this is true, this is real. The risen Lord is a true and real person. By the way, do you know that one of the qualifications for apostleship was seeing the risen Lord. 
if you if you were going to be called an apostle, one of the things you had to do was have seen Jesus Christ is risen. Okay? So if anyone today tells you that they're an apostle, the next question you should ask is, how old are you? <laughs> because that's a qualification. You had to see the risen Lord. Anyway, we have been given, we have received the good news about Jesus Christ, that the resurrection is true, it's been attested to, not by fake news, but by eyewitnesses. So Paul has defined what the gospel is for us here. The good news, but now it begs the question, right? Why is this news good? Why do we call it good news and not just news? Now, we had a couple of hints in our passage in Corinthians already. Again, go back to verse 2. And by which, he's talking about the gospel, you are being saved. As I stated earlier, this is, this is God's ordained means of bringing people into his kingdom, of saving them. That's why it's good news. Right? It does something. It brings about faith, which brings about salvation. Consider what Paul said elsewhere in Romans 10. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So faith comes through hearing what? God's word, the gospel, the news about what Jesus had done. So people often ask in these these debates, well, couldn't God save someone this way? And couldn't God save someone that way? And I say, yeah, probably God can do whatever he wants to do. The point is that God has promised to use this to save people. That's the God-ordained means that he has used. What he has promised to use is faithful men preaching what they've delivered and passing it on. A simple message, and people think that we're crazy. By just telling someone news that, that's going to change someone, well, through the Holy Spirit, absolutely. That's what he said he's going to do. That's what he said he's going to do. The other thing that Paul tells us about why this news is good is because it saves us. It's e- eternal. It's an eternal message. Again, Not for his own sin that he died, but for our sins. That's why it's good. It's not that Jesus died for his own sin. We would say, oh, that's just. He sinned, he should die, that's a good thing. But no, he died because of our sin. That's why it's good news. Not for his sin, but because someone died for our sin. That's what makes it good. It's good news because when that fact is apprehended by faith, that the guilt that is imputed, or the guilt is imputed to Christ and not us, that's why it's good. He died and he was vindicated by the resurrection. You know what that was? The resurrection was a vindication of what Jesus said. That who he said he was, he really was. And that's good news. God told us that the soul that sins shall die, but Jesus didn't sin, so he shouldn't have died, but he did. Voluntarily. That's why the gospel is good news. That's why it's not just that Jesus died, it's that Jesus died for our sins. That's promising that any who have faith in him and what he has done will not suffer a second death. See, the good news is good news because in reality, what it does is it is the answer to all of life's problems. We may not think that, but it's true. We live in a broken, fallen, and very sinful world. If you don't believe me, go read the news or the fake news. This is why, okay, this is why Every broken heart, every shot fired on a battlefield or in a movie theater or in a school, every lonely night that you spend in your house, every daily battle with depression, every abortion, every brittle jab from a poisoned tongue, every broken relationship, every diagnosis of cancer, every silent suffering, every loss of a loved one, every horrible job, every division in the church, every family drama, every prodigal son who's eating the husks, every starving orphan, every loss of innocence from a young girl, every child with a medical illness, every lonely night in prison, every wailing siren, every grudge, every bad attitude, cries out for something better. And praise God, we have something better. Did I miss anybody in that list? The gospel, see, it doesn't remove trials, but it will make enduring them sweeter. And ultimately, the last trial that we all will face, unless the Lord comes, is death. 
This is why Paul says that he makes known to them again what he already preached to them before about the resurrection. Now, I was thinking this week, the last couple of weeks actually, of, of Charlie Gard. Do we know who Charlie Gard is? If you don't know who that is, he's that infant who was 11 months old and this rare medical condition, and he died actually a couple of weeks ago, I believe. And his parents had raised enough money to, to bring him to America or to have someone fly out there and to treat him. But the hospital wouldn't let him leave. So the dismay of his parents, the hospital thought it was in Charlie's best interest to withdraw treatment and let Charlie, quote, die with dignity. To die with dignity. I'm going to tell you, there's no such thing. Why? Because there's no such thing as a dignified death. I'm going to ruffle some feathers with that, I know. So come talk to me afterwards. I'll be hiding in the back. (laughs) I know it's going to ruffle some, but there's no such thing as a dignified death. And I'm going to tell you why that is. Sin brought death. So how can it be dignified? So while a great many people, don't hear me wrong, while a great many people die well, okay, they die well, that doesn't mean that their death is dignified. We have all of our, we've known our fair share of saints, even in this body, who have died very well and finished the race. But it doesn't mean that their death was dignified. Because death reminds us that it's unnatural. That wasn't the intent. It brought death into the world. Sin brought death into the world. So it's not dignified. It can't be. Now death, we heard Ken say a few weeks ago, yeah, it's, it's a chariot now, right? It takes us to be with the Lord. We get that. But the fact that people die is not a dignified thing. It's a consequence of sin. Again, it's not a dignified death. So death reminds us that sin is an awful, terrible thing and that the penalty for it is death. So much so that Jesus himself, think about this, Jesus himself wept over his friend Lazarus when he died. And he knew he was going to bring him back to life. But Jesus wept because of what death had done to his world. Not only did he weep over Lazarus' death, the sinless one himself had to die. And we remember him in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, if this cup can pass, take it from me. Because he knew what was going to happen. So our hope should not be in a dignified death, but in eternal life. Don't aim to die with dignity. Aim to have life. Eternal life. He who is eternal life, Jesus Christ. Ken pointed this out again last week that our hope isn't in this world that it's it's stored in bank accounts or health or good deeds or just being a nice person. It's in this good news of Jesus Christ that he died for our sins, he was buried, and he is no longer dead. It's this gospel of God that changes people according to the scriptures. So I ask you, if you don't believe this, then what do you believe? Where are you going to go to? Where are you going to turn? There is no other way than this good news. Every other way is a false way. Spurgeon said this. He said, if God does not save men by truth, he certainly will not save them by lies. And if the old gospel is not competent to work regeneration, indeed a revival, then we will do without the revival. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is simple, and yet it's profound. And it's proclaimed on this day to you, so you would not have a dignified death, but you would have eternal life. And have it more abundantly. Jesus says, come. I know the elders will be up here after the service, and if you don't understand what I've said, which is not unusual, people don't understand what I say, come up and talk to them. But know that this is the gospel. This is the simple news that God has declared to you so you can live. And we praise God for it. That it's not about us, but it's about Him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this good news. The fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. 
for my sin. And because of that death, he was buried. And that he is no longer dead. We praise your name that you have saw fit to use this means, this gospel to save people. And we thank you for that. We pray that in every conversation we have, that this would be our top priority. That would be in the back of our minds constantly of what you have done. Not about what we have done, but what you have done. I would ask you would bless any who have heard this word today, who can hear my voice, to hear your voice. To hear your news. And we thank you for it. And I pray these things in the name of your Son, faithful and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.